Thanks for joining us today. At City Life, we have one purpose, making it easy for people to say yes to Jesus. We believe today's message will empower you to do exactly that. But remember that church is so much more than a sermon you listen to. It's a living, breathing community that we invite you to be a part of. We hope to see you on a Sunday morning at City Life. Well, Into the Unknown. Has this been, been a good series for you? This has been, uh, I think, the strangest season that I have ever gone through while I've been alive. And, and I think it's kind of cool that we get to go through it because this will be a time in history that the history books, like our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren, will learn about this in school years from now. I don't know what they'll say about it years from now. <clears throat> But uh, it's a great time to, uh, you know, it, God wants to do something significant in your life in every season. And so I want to talk about today, I want to talk about uh, into the unknown for the better. For the better. You know, all through life we go through, we go through times where we don't know what the future holds. But we do know one thing is that God makes all things new. God renews us. He renews your spirit. He renews your soul. He renews you body, soul, and spirit. And, and so we don't know what the future holds, but what we do know is that God has good things in your future. And so welcome those online, those eating breakfast right now, those with a steaming pile of pancakes right in front of you. As you eat, you know, we need, to, we need to come up with an equalization method for in this room. How about some big plates of bacon? Socially distant bacon that just will have tongs. <laughs> Bring your own tongs, because we can't share tongs. But bacon, pancakes with individual tongs. So a couple of weeks ago, I talked about um, there's three areas that God wants, uh, that there's three areas that we need in our life in order to have a well-ordered heart. And the first is personal freedom. The second is meaning. And the third is relationships. And so uh, just to summarize that, you know, personal freedom is, that's actually the core message of the gospel. Jesus came to set us free. He came to bring freedom to the, to the lives of people, to set at liberty those that are oppressed. If there is something in your life where you feel you have been restricted, where you feel like you're less than you're supposed to be, the message of the gospel is that Jesus came to bring freedom to those areas in your life. But uh, as we also looked at, uh, our Western culture has kind of swung way to the right on this whole personal freedom thing. And we've, we've kind of made personal freedom everything. You know, and we've kind of made it that if you touch someone's right to choose or some, you touch someone's personal freedom, you've kind of committed the unforgivable sin in our culture or in our world. You've, it, 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 but what happens is when we swing way to the right on personal freedom, it actually ends up pulling us out of the other two. It actually ends up pulling us out of significance or meaning, and it actually ends up pulling us out of, of relationships or, or deep uh, relational connection, because these three, it's kind of a balancing act that work with these three. You, you, you can, sometimes you have to give up a bit of freedom so that you can experience deeper relationships. And every married couple said, that's the truth. <laughs> sometimes when you want a deeper relationship, your personal freedom has to just diminish a little bit. And if you, if you want your personal freedom above everything else, well, good luck in your relationships you can write the book on failed relationships later. Uh, you know, to have a life of meaning sometimes means we have to give up some personal freedom. Sometimes it, there's, it's a balancing act between the three. And, uh, you know, we were created for a purpose. You, you, you know, the Bible says we're saved by grace, but it also says we were saved for good works. We were saved for something. that We weren't just, we weren't just put on this earth just to kind of do some time and, you know, that, that, that God could tell us he loves us. He actually put us here to do something significant. 
And so we're, we're part of our internal programming is to contribute to something that's greater than ourselves. And in fact, it's, we're not actually happy people when we're selfish. When you start living selfishly, you notice uh, you actually get unhappier and unha- more unhappy, unhappier, which is the proper word. It's both. Both will happen to you. You will become unhappier, more unhappily. Um, you know, when we're selfish, we don't, we're not happy. It's actually happiness comes, comes out of selflessness. That, 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 that personal fulfillment comes out of, out of making a contribution, of, of, of being a part of something. And, uh, you know, of course, relationships. And that was, we looked at, we looked at um, you know, of creation. When, when God put uh, Adam on the earth, that was actually the first thing in all of creation that God said. We looked at Adam by himself, and, and God was with Adam, but he looked at Adam and said, it is not good for him to be alone. And uh, this was before there was even sin on the earth. That God was, in, a, in, a, in essence, God was admitting, I am not enough for Adam by myself. Adam needs something more. What does he need? He needs relationship. He needs, he needs other. And so if you're finding yourself in that place where maybe personal freedom or personal choice is really high, but relationship is really low, it's not good for you to be alone. It's not good to be alone. We need connection. And, and uh, connection it re- actually rewires us. It actually creates something in us uh, that, that creates healing and wholeness in us as we're in relationship. In fact, there's some changes in your life that you've prayed for that actually won't happen until you get into the right connections in your life, till you connect with the right people. It, and it, in the neuroscience world, they call it integration. It's something that happens as we, as we share our lives with each other. Our brain is actually healed as we share our lives with one another. How, how does that work? I don't know, but God designed it, and he recognized it right away when he saw Adam alone. He said, that's not good. I need to create, I need to create companionship for him. And so we need reserves in our life of, of freedom. We need meaning, and we need relationships, and we need to balance these things with each other. And in order, you know, in, in order to experience uh, strength in all three of these areas. There's times that we have to give up something in one of the areas to, in order to strengthen another. And, uh, you know, to Jesus, when he came to the earth, he said, I, I want to, he, he said, I'm creating a system, and he called it the kingdom of heaven. And the kingdom of heaven, we've, we've talked a lot about this lately, is that it's, it's marked by three things, rightness, peace, righteousness, peace, and joy. He wants to create rightness in our lives. He wants to create peace, and he wants to bring joy into our lives. And this, this word peace, it, it, it's the, 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 the Hebrew word is shalom. And it's, it's more than what we have. It's more than what we have a definition for the word of peace in our language. It is, it's a peace that's complete. It's a, it's a peace that's complex, so it's taking, it's taking many parts and bringing them together into a place of, of, uh, of harmony, a place of unity, a place of wholeness. And this is the kind of peace, God, you know, we have, a, we have a couple versions of peace in our world. We have peace, which is just absence of conflict, you know, but that's not actually a complete peace. Peace is when things work harmoniously. You know, we look at all the tensions that are taking place in our world today, and if there's not another crisis in the news, we could say, well, there was peace this week. But that's not really peace, is it? Because there's all these underlying issues that, that they go out of, out of sight and they go out of mind, but they're actually, they actually haven't gone away. Well, the shalom peace is when these issues go away where there, there is healing and harmony and restoration. So you may have areas in your life right now where there is lack of conflict, but there's not actually peace. There's not actually harmony in that area. Well, you know, in, in every season, God wants to bring you into, into ex, an experience of greater peace, of greater harmony, a complex peace, not just an absence of conflict, but an actual peace that goes deeper than that. 
this kingdom of heaven, this system of righteousness and peace and joy, this is, this is a system that Jesus started, but it starts inwardly and it works its way outwardly. It starts, it starts in our hearts. It starts in our inward lives and it works its way out. It's not, it's not a system of behavior management, which so often we want to reduce the Bible down to behavior management. Good Christians don't do blank, blank, blank. Good Christians do do. I said do do. <laughs> they do blank, blank, blank. But that's actually not what makes, that's not actually what makes us a part of the kingdom of heaven. What makes us a part of a ki the kingdom of heaven is that our hearts have been transformed. And, you know, when your heart gets transformed, doing the right things gets a lot easier. When your heart's changed, it gets a lot easier. You know, as you address your children in certain areas of their life, it's very easy to just try and get them to just, you know, I just want you to clean your room. Or I just want you to put your dishes in the dishwasher. Isn't that right, Sam? <clears throat> Just, just a little dig right there. I have, the, I have the microphone. I'm allowed to do that. But you know, it's more than that. It's, it's, it's actually, I have, to, I have to give Sam some credit. Because <laughs> when, when Sam went to school in Australia, she was a rather, um, uh, what would you say, not a cleaning individual. And this is her story. I should let her tell it, but I'm going to tell it for her. But she went and then lived with people in Australia who were worse than she was. And then she came back and she's like, I am so thankful that you and mom are clean. <laughs> and, and she has been much better, much better since. There's something that happens with your kids when they go live on their own. And they have to actually do things for themselves. It transforms their heart. <clears throat> and uh, they come back different. But you know, this, I am so lost in my notes now. That was, so what, what, uh, Jesus actually told a parable about this. Um, he, he told many parables about the kingdom of heaven and, and what the kingdom of heaven was like. And there was this parable that is called the sower and the seed. And this is a parable about how to experience change or transformation in our lives. And uh, maybe, maybe husbands or guys, uh, you can relate to this experience. I'm sure you ladies can relate to this experience too. But have you ever been given uh, maybe a teach? You've been exposed to some information or somebody, uh, somebody taught you something or tried to teach you something uh, and you just kind of dismissed it. You didn't really pay much attention to it. And only to later come back and realize that that information came back in front of you. And you realize that that information was actually very profound and life-changing. And the first time, you just completely ignored it. This most ap ha often happens with me with something my wife tells me. That, you know, she, she, she's just smirking in the front row because, you know... It happens quite frequently. <clears throat> that she tells me something that it, it's like this is life-changing and profound, but me, being the stubborn man that I am, I just go on to ignore her. <clears throat> Only to come back later and realize what she said was actually very profound. Sometimes years later. And uh, we get there, just not very quickly. So, you know, why, why is that? That sometimes... There's times in our life where we're receptive for truth, and other times we're not. Sometimes we're receptive to a teaching, and when we receive it, it actually changes our whole life experience. But we can go through a time in life where that teaching can come to us, and it actually has no effect at all. It, it just does not, it just washes right through. Or maybe you've gone through the experience where you were exposed to a certain kind of uh, a, a teaching or a truth and it, it changed your life. So you tried to tell your friends about it. Yeah, because you're excited. Let me tell you about CrossFit. <laughs> and so you get excited about it. 
And you try and tell her, you need to do this, it's so great. Or you need to try this, it's so great. And it just like, boop, 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 boop. Like just no effect whatsoever. Well, why is that? Well, Jesus, Jesus taught a parable about exactly why this is. And so we're going to go to Matthew chapter 13, where Jesus is teaching. He says, later that same day, Jesus left the house and sat beside the lake. A large crowd gathered, or a large crowd soon gathered around him. So he got into a boat and he sat there and he taught the people as the people stood on the shore. He told many stories in the form of parables, such as this one. Listen, a farmer went out to plant some seeds, and as he scattered them across his field, some seeds fell on the footpath, and birds came and ate them. Other seeds fell on shallow soil with underlying rock. The seeds sprouted quickly because the soil was shallow, but the plants soon wilted under the hot sun. And since they didn't have deep roots, they died. Other seeds fell among thorns that grew up and choked out the tender plants. That's most often what my garden looks like. <laughs> Still, other seeds fell on fertile soil, and they produced a crop that was 30, 60, and even 100 times as much as, as had been planted. And then he finishes it off with this statement. Anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. Anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. The point that Jesus was making here is not that it, it's that we are not the farmers. We're not the seed. We are not the rain, the sun, the heat, the rocks. We are the dirt. We're the dirt. Everybody say, I'm the dirt. And the, the whole point of this message is to be good at being dirt. To be good dirt. This, that's, that's the whole point. Our job is to be good dirt. Good dirt. And this is the process of change is that as we, we're going to look at that a little more later. <clears throat> but, you know, the, the, this, is, this is the process of change is as is that we're actually cultivating our heart and our life to be receptive to truth, to be receptive to teaching. When we get, and he, and he later gave some explanations as to what these were, he, you know, the, the seed that was stolen by the birds, that was basically, he was saying that was, that was just people who lack understanding. It's, in other words, the truth was there, but they just, just didn't have the under. In other words, they hadn't studied or they, hadn't, they weren't receptive to it or they weren't applying themselves to it. So there was no understanding. It couldn't take root. The second was the, the rocky the, the rocky soil was just basically the cares of this world, or sorry, not the cares of this world, the, the stresses, and, uh, and then the, the thorny soil was the cares of the world that just choke out life, and then he, and then he talks about uh, making sure we have well-cultivated soil in our lives. And so this is the process of change. It actually goes through four stages. The process of, of seeing change internally and change in our hearts. It goes through four stages. And the first stage, many of you have experienced this stage at different times in your life, is the stage of discontent. The discontent. How many of you have ever felt discontent in your life? How many are feeling it right now? You don't have to put your hand up. If you don't want to, yeah, your sermon could be better, Mike. I'm a little discontented with that. <laughs> you know, we discontent, we become discontent with the state of our heart. We become discontent with the state of our lives. We realize that I was created for more than I'm experiencing right now. There's I am or I was created for more than than what what I'm accepting or what I'm, what I'm allowing in my life or just going through the, the, the motions of every day. You know, Monica said, I believe it was last week, last week's message, you said, you know, what makes dirt good is when it has some poop in it. I worked it into the message, everybody. We got poop in this week as well. But this is what makes dirt good is when you put some poop in it. And I'll tell you, what makes your life good is when you have to deal with some poop every once in a while. That's fertilizer. And it stinks at first. 
but it produces life later. This last few months has put a lot of people in this state of change, this discontent. I just want to tell you this. You can get this on a t-shirt. Is don't fear the poop. Don't fear the poop. Don't fear the tough situations that you don't understand. Because they're true. What happens is they, they actually get our heart ready for real change. Discontent gets our heart ready for change. A lot of times we don't want discontent. We don't, we want, we feel like there's something wrong in our faith when we're discontent, but we're, there's actually not. Discontent is a part of change. When we're not happy with things, we're much more likely to start crying out to God. We're, we're much more likely to, to start being open to what he wants to do in our lives. You know, when we're, when we're happy and content, we don't change. You don't. When you're happy and you're content, you, you know, we just sit back, we relax, we just enjoy things all the time. But discontent is actually a good thing. Discontent in our lives is a good thing. It, it's, the, it's the place where renewal starts in our hearts. And when we become discontent with the state of the church, and I don't just mean in a critical sense, but in the sense that, you know what, I need to be a part of making the church better. I need, to be, I need to be involved in, in making the church what God said it should be, and that's a light in the world around us. We start, we start experiencing a genuine hunger for the greater things of God, and at the, the power and the potential of what he wants to do in us and through us. Sometimes we become uh, discontent with areas of our life. Maybe it's emotionally, maybe it's our, our spiritual life, or maybe it's our attitudes. If you know someone like that, you can bump them right now. Next, next to you is, it's like, you know, there's, there's areas that we just, that, that discontent is actually going to lead us to something better. Wisdom is knowing how to deal with this discontent. We don't need to be fearful of it. We don't need to dread it. It's it's recognizing that discontent is actually the first step of significant change in our lives. And that there's a lot of things you won't change in your life until you first reach that place of discontent with how it is. And, uh, you know, I think wisdom also understands the difference between happiness and joy. Most of our world is seeking happiness. We, you know, happiness is what you get when you buy new shoes. You get a shirt. You go to Disneyland. That's happiness. And we've kind of, you know, elevated happiness as to the end all in our society. But that's, that's actually not joy. That's not, God, you know, the, the kingdom of heaven is rightness, peace, and joy but not necessarily happiness. Happiness is fleeting. Happiness lacks root. You can be happy in the morning and sad at night. You can be happy at 9 a.m. and sad at 10 a.m. But joy is deep-rooted. You can have joy when you're unhappy. Joy is confidence that God will see us through. Joy is confidence that, that what God has started, he will bring to completion. Joy is rooted in God's character, not our circumstances, which change all the time, which we've seen in the last season, that, that we can have the rug of circumstances completely yanked out from underneath us. But you cannot have the rug of God's promise or the foundation of God's promise yanked out from underneath you. His promise is sure. And so our our joy is rooted in something much greater than Disneyland shoes and shirts. It's rooted in God's promise and his presence. So don't be afraid of unhappiness. Unhappiness is not our enemy. Discontent is not our enemy And we need to learn how to embrace seasons of discontent so that they can move us into something better. All right. So what does that bring us to? The second stage of change, which is preparation. 
preparation, where we begin to change. We give, we give God permission to deal with our heart. We allow that, that discontent to actually lead us to, to learning, to uh, addressing the obstacles in our heart, addressing the, the things that maybe we've been ignoring when we were happy, but then now that we're discontent, we realize, you know what, there's some deeper things. There's some deeper things in my life that I have to address. I have to address the things, the attitudes that are harming my relationships. I need to address the attitudes that are harming my spiritual life or my forward progress. You know, in this time of preparation, this is where uh, times of silence and solitude can be very valuable. This is where you take uh, that discontent and instead of trying to just Netflix it away or just keep yourself occupied until the feeling goes away, it's like you, you realize that, you know what, I need to address this. And, and you take those times and uh, you create some space, some time and space from the world around you to reflect and to begin to uh, begin to allow uh, God to speak to you. You know, as we move on from discontent, it's, it's actually, that's where the student in us starts to emerge. That's where the learner starts to emerge. That's where we begin to uh, reflect and learn like our future depends on it, which it does, by the way. You know, preparation starts with learning. And, and uh, you know, as you, as you realize something needs to change, then, and you, as you start to prepare, you realize that, you know what, I need to start putting, I need to part, start putting some new things in me if I want new things to come out of me. Uh, Hosea 4.6, it, it says that my people perish for lack of knowledge. We need to get knowledge of, of uh, how to change, knowledge of a better way of living in us. And then, as we get that knowledge, as we, as we begin to learn, it leads us to the third step, which is a step of contending. The step of contending, where it's not just I want to learn about a better or hear about a better way of, of life, but I am, I'm actually going to start fighting for a better way of life. I'm going to, and, and you see it, you know, when you see people go through this stage, you can see it happen in their lives where it's like a switch goes on, where they say, you know what, I am going to start working at this. I am going to start taking this seriously. We begin to work for change. We begin to stretch. We begin to pray. We begin to persist. And this isn't just willpower alone. This is, this is as, as, as we begin to do this, God begins to work with us. See, God needs our cooperation. God, wa God always wants to work in us, but he needs us to want him to work in us in order to experience that change. And so we start to, we start to, at the, these, this is a stage where we start giving serious consideration to that which we're allowing into our life, what, that which is influencing us, that which is shaping the way we think or shaping or influencing our relationships. And you start asking the question, what am I exposing my heart to? What am I exposing my life to? What are the influences that are, uh, you know, there's a lot of things that we call entertainment in our day and age that are actually just toxic. Like, they're just not good things, and yet, if we put them under the title of entertainment, it's okay. It's not okay if it wrecks your heart. If it ruins your heart, it's not okay. That seemed like a good pause break right there. You know, what are the thoughts that are occupying our day? What are the thoughts... Why are, why are we allowing those thoughts and not other thoughts? Well, it's, it's what we're exposing ourselves to. It's, what, it's the thoughts that we're, that we're, that we're fighting for. And I'll, I'll tell you something. It's, it's as we're in this stage of contending, that's where the temptation to return to old ways comes in. That's where that, because we can get tired of the fight. And that's where, you know, the, the, we find verses in the Bible that says, like, you don't grow weary in, in well-doing. Because in its time, it produces a harvest if you don't quit. And, uh, you know, Jesus, when he contended, there's, there talks about the temptation of Jesus. It says when he, when he was to be, it says he went into the wilderness to be tempted. 
And you know what's interesting is the wilderness, a lot, I've heard a lot of messages about the wilderness. It's like, well, the wilderness is a place of temptation. A wilderness is a place of testing. And, you know, you go through the wilderness. The wilderness is actually not a place of temptation. Jesus knew he was going to be tempted. So he went to the place where he knew he would be the strongest. And that was a place where he was cut off from the negative voices, cut off, isolated from the influence of the masses or the influence of the world where he knew I can, I, my relationship with my father can be its strongest in this place of solitude in the wilderness, which is actually the most accurate to say out in nature. It wasn't like this crazy tigers jumping from behind place. You know, that place of strength where, you know, when you, when you were in that place of contending, that's the time to get out in the place where you're, you can be your strongest. Turn off the voice of the world. And it's as we contend, the good habits begin to form in our lives. And this sets the stage for us as to what Jesus described us as being good soil. Where the changes start to take root, where the changes start to grow, and we start to experience what Jesus called the 30, the 60, even the 100-fold return on what you put in. That comes after we've reoriented our life around God's system. You know, whatever stage you're at, God is working to move you forward in this season. Whether you're in that stage of discontent, you know, sometimes our prayer just needs to be, God, help me go forward out of this season. Or maybe you're in a season where you've been, uh, you've been learning, you've just been, you've been putting in some, some new some new information, or maybe you're in that system where, uh, in that stage where it's like, you know, I am just contending. I've made some changes, but I, I know I just, now I need to fight for those changes to stay there. Wherever you're at, God has grace for you at that stage, and he's got grace for your life to go forward in whatever season you're at. Father, we thank you that you have healed and forgiven and transformed and you freed us from the power of death and from sin. And, and you promised that you are near to all those who call on you. And Father, wherever, wherever people are at, wherever, whatever situation they're at right now, you're just as far away as us calling upon you. Whatever stage of our journey or whatever stage of our walk with you, all you're waiting for is for us to call on you and I want to just encourage you if you're you're here in this place or you're watching online right now Jesus is just a call away he is just one call and he's just waiting for us to call to him and I want to encourage you if you've maybe you've never maybe you've never said yes to Jesus maybe you've never said yes to his plan or his purpose or his forgiveness and grace he wants to he wants to meet you today. And I'm going to lead us in a prayer. And if you want to be included in that prayer, you can just join me as I pray. Let's pray together. Jesus, I call out to you. I want your plan to be worked in my heart and in my life. Would you come into my life? Lead me. Guide me. Forgive me. And bring me to a new place of freedom and meaning and purpose. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. That's great. We hope today's message encouraged you. If you want to take your next step in saying yes to Jesus, you can always contact us at cty.lc or fill out the next step section on the City Life app. It's an honor as a church to play just a small part in what God is doing in your life. We look forward to seeing you soon here at City Life.